genetics, and record basis, and so on, we can make novel and quite specific predictions about language that there will be no reason to make based on the more certain strength of the language. That's pretty powerful. Right. That's like the one, uh, one liner, two liner. So this is, now this isn't working yet. <laughs> That's your work only slide, right? <laughs> <laughs> or something. This is work. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thanks. This is highly collaborative work. I thank all my collaborators at Georgetown and Thanks, elsewhere, Greg. including, uh, as Ken said, both Lloyd Cutting and uh, Samantha. Okay, so first let's go through the motivation and approach of this research program. So evolution biology tend to reuse existing systems or mechanisms or genes, etc., for new functions. That's just the way it works in general. So if scales evolve into feathers. Feathers were originally used for thermal regulation, it appears, um, for flight. Fins evolved into limbs and wings and hands, and going full circle, the, the, you know, the wing can be used to help certain birds swim, um, or one of my favorite examples to shade um, their prey. So there's certain species of heron, like black heron, tricolor heron, that use their wings to shade the water to help to better see their prey. So you have a completely new function with an existing structure without any structural adaptation whatsoever. Okay. So given these principles of uh, evolution biology, in particular this co-optation of existing mechanisms or new functions, we should expect that language depend, so I can make this work, at least in part, if not largely, on pre-existing mechanisms and systems, um, whether or not those have been, have become more specialized for language, okay, either evolutionarily, phylogenetically, or developmentally, ontogenetically. Okay? Of course, the fact that you have cooptation doesn't preclude further specialization. And we simply focus on two systems, declarative memory and procedural memory, simply because most if not all of language, depending on your point of view, has to be learned. And these are arguably the two most important learning and memory systems in the brain. Okay, and um, I'm very spatial, so this declarative memory will always be here. I'm using my hands sometimes. <laughs> and uh, procedural memory here, and also declarative memory for those of you who are more color sensitive. It's gonna be that greenish, bluish color, and uh, procedural memory this kind of reddish color. So our approach is simply to test if and how various aspects of language depend on the system. That's our entire approach. Okay? And as I said in the opening slide, one of the advantages of this approach is that both the animal and human studies, animals mainly rodents as well as non-human primates, but also other vertebrates as well, we know a lot about the systems on a computational basis, how learning occurs on an anatomical basis, uh, molecular genetic, how uh, new area number, new areas of research is how learning and retention can be improved in these systems. We know about that too for these systems. So that should apply to language as well. Thus, we can make, based on this independent knowledge um, of the two learning memory systems, we can make specific novel, novel and testable predictions about language, as I said, that may be unwarranted in more limited study of language. So it's a very powerful approach. So for example, you know, how did we discover genes for language? Well, largely serendipitous, right? Based on disorders or you know, GWAS study or something like that. Well, here we have predictions. We know that you know, APOE or BDNF, that some people talked about, and so on, play particular roles in these one of the other memory systems, so they should play roles of a particular sort in language. It's an extremely powerful approach. Doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> you know, as, Nick and I will just say most science is wrong. You know, most empirical studies are not replicable or reproducible. Um, and you know, most theories are part, at least partly, if not largely, wrong, probably particularly in our area where you have complex systems and a lot of noise. So, but nonetheless, I think there's something a little bit right about this, as we'll see. <clears throat> so the bottom line, and I'm going to sort of end with this slide as well, but a bit more information. So repetition is how one learns, right? Uh, with space. So converging evidence from different approaches, different experiments, and so on, suggests that language, in fact, does depend on both of these learning and memory systems, and that lexical and grammatical knowledge depend differentially on the two systems in interesting ways, in non-simplistic ways. The learning and use of idiosyncratic points, lexical knowledge depends heavily on declarative memory and little 
not nothing, but little on procedural memory. So one of the ways to you are heavily uh, study uh, uh, work expectations is over learning. That does seem to contribute to the learning, but little as compared to which depends in large part on the nuclei on procedural memory, um, but less, much less procedural than better memory. Um, for reasons that we don't fully understand. I'll talk a little bit about that earlier. <clears throat> in contrast, rule governed, that is grammatical knowledge, depends heavily on procedural memory, but also, also to a fair extent on declarative memory as a function of particular factors, subject level, item level, input level, and other factors, such as, for example, females on average tend to depend more on declarative memory for certain aspects of grammar than males, second language learners compared to first language learners, L2, second language developmental kids with developmental language disorder, formerly known basically as SLI, compared to typical um, kids, developing kids, or for different reasons that I'll talk about, or, or higher frequency items. If you hear a particular complex form like the cat a thousand times or a million times, you're going to start have a high likelihood of memorizing this chunk, okay, which will likely be in declarative memory. Okay, so there are lots of factors that can push um, the dependence of grammatical functions towards one or the other system. Okay? Therefore, the two systems play at least partially redundant roles in that sense. They can both support a large set of functions, grammatical functions. Yes, Jay? You might, maybe you can ask this but going forward, but at this point, I'm just curious about the, about the distinction between the two types of knowledge. In particular, where does phonotactic knowledge? Oh, sorry, okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> the simple answer is everything depends on both. <laughs> Not quite sure, took the spectrum of arbitrary stuff, but, but uh, yeah, well, I'll actually specifically talk about that very briefly. So, that's in the next uh, few slides, I'll first have one slide about declarative memory, what is the same, then one about procedural memory, and the third slide is going to be how, in some ways, that are critical for this talk, how, in some ways in which the two systems interact, then predictions based on this independent knowledge for language, with some key predictions, and then the rest of the talk of the evidence, first on first language, then on second language, and then on developmental disorders with a focus on DLD, developmental language disorder, but I'll briefly talk about dyslexia theory and math disability as well. Okay, so I should say up front that uh, people use these terms very differently. We define the terms very specifically, declarative and procedural memory, as the learning and memory that depends on is rooted in respectively medial temporal lobe or the basal game. Okay, so it's not implicit, not defined that way, the technique is very messy. It's a very specific combination of learning and memory, so behavioral, that, just in that respect, on these circuits. <coughs> so the declarative memory system is found in other vertebrates. It's an old system. For example, it helps birds on the cursor to the hippocampus, helps birds uh, remember where they put their acorns. This is often characterized as knowledge for what? For example, that uh, Ken and I in Beijing had dinner at this kind of fancy, strange tea house and made a vegetarian meal, it's quite cool. Um, just, just, you know, it's an event, episodic event, okay? Uh, or knowing a fact, um, that the capital of Burkina Faso is Mogadougou, about geography, and African geography in particular. Um, and the system seems to be specialized for learning arbitrary bits of information, this is key, and associating them, such as Ken, Beijing, Michael, Dinner, Tea House, or Burkina Faso, Waka, things like that, just arbitrary stuff. Learning is very rapid in the system, so a single presentation is sufficient to learn stuff, such as the information I just presented to you, which of course is always in learning, repetition improves uh, learning, instructive representations. And knowledge is not just explicit, but also implicit in the system. That's really key. So we're not defining, as I said before, in terms of this distinction, but in terms of the circuitry, what the learning and memory of the circuitry supports, and it's implicit as well as explicit. That is not available as well as available conscious awareness. <coughs> How about the functional neuroanatomy? That's what parts of the brain do what? System is rooted in the hippocampus and other medial temporal structures, such as the interrhinal and perirhinal <coughs> cortex, which underlie learning and consolidation of new information. So consolidation is stabilization of information over time, including but not equally mostly. Um, and your cortex, especially but not only the temporal lobes, underlies the long-term representation of this information, though importantly for some of our work, aging for example, line of research for us, um, 
longer term information of a certain sort, such as lower frequency information, still seems to depend importantly on the hippocampus. Uh, and for other regions in this network also play a role. So for example, uh, frontal regions, particularly on Broadman's area 45, 47, seem to be involved in something like pulling out of this information, the recall of this information. Okay. Um, I won't go through this since you know the brain. I don't have much time. So uh, we also understand something about the neural, um, the lower level biological substrates. So the neurotransmitter acetylcholine plays a role, uh, an important role in this, as does the hormone estrogen, and okay, picture of the molecule, uh, one form of estrogen. Um, and this may help explain why on average, uh, females tend to have uh, higher, or help explain, why not the only factor, uh, better declarative memory than males. Um, which is one of our areas of study. Um, we view this as both sort of something on its own, but also as a way of examining individual differences at a group level. Uh, various genes play a role, including for the proteins PDNF. So for example, you know, area of recent work on your part, looking at the VAL66 MET SNP, signal nucleotide polymorphism. Oops, I have no idea what happened. Whoa. <laughs> is, is, the, is the guy around? <laughs> <laughs> you, you might have pushed one of the buttons. I deactivates the uh, property. Oh, yeah. That's okay. Can I it went back. <laughs> that was because I showed up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you. Magic. Um, so yeah, so the the the, the single point mutation that results in um, for the base that results in uh, valine, results in better declarative memory in large hippocampi, although apparently not in kids, according to their recent study. Um, uh, than, than methionine. So, I mean, that's one single point mutation, right? Single point mutation on the gene. Um, or APOE, um, actually, this reminds me to briefly mention this, seconds of digression or so. So, we have a new study of ours that's on aging, which I'll mention at the very end. We just got preliminary included as a genetic component. So, of course, we're looking at predicted involvement of genes that we predict to be involved, in this case, in lexical processing. and. We found, I believe, for the first time that um, uh, APOE, so e APOE4 in particular, which is associated with uh, smaller hippocampal volumes and worse declarative memory, particularly in aging, actually is associated with worse, with lower lexical processing ability, which is really important. It's also nice to predict it. In fact, there's even a hint, I don't know if any of you know much about APOE4, somebody called that tankadistic pleiotropy, you know what that is, where a single gene has both has different effects, both positive and negative. And so there are findings with APOE4 that young people actually are better at episodic and critic memory um, they have APOE4. And we're actually finding hints of that. We actually, our curve is like this. So APOE4 higher for younger people. It's pretty cool. Okay, procedural memory. <coughs> um, we know, we understand less about procedural memory in general than declarative memory, which is it's a more difficult piece to pin down for our studies on it. Um, nonetheless, we know something. It's also found in other vertebrates. So for example, it helps rats follow rule governed grooming sequences. This is often characterized as knowledge for how. Um, that is learning and processing of motor and cognitive skills, such as typing, riding a bicycle, sequence learning, learning categories, rules, or group learning of particular sorts, that is navigation. Have you ever, any of you ever heard of response strategies, response learning in, in rodents? So for example, when a teammate, you're going to put the rat in the bottom of the tee, the tee, and you train them, reward them to always turn in one direction, let's say left, okay? That depends on the screen. And you'll see in the next slide that you could also navigate using the other system. Okay? The system may be specialized for learning to predict, particularly when with respect to rapid feedback, which can include not only external feedback such as a reward, explicit separate feedback, I should say, but also the next step, the predicted item that can constitute feedback. So in a sequence, for example, or in grammar. So you're predicting what's next happened, that can constitute the feedback. And if it occurs rapidly after your prediction, where rapidly is a bit nebulous based on literature, not really clear what that is, we looked into that. Um, then this system is favored. Okay. If it occurs slowly, then the other system seems to favor it. Okay. It's really important for a lot of things that you guys <laughs> do, I think. 
<coughs> learning is gradual in the system. You don't want to ride a bicycle right away. Um, but eventually the skills that are learned, the procedures that are learned are rapid and more likely. Okay? What's called automatization. Okay? And hard to change as well. Okay? With excellent retention. You don't really forget how to ride a bicycle. And the knowledge in the system is apparently only implicit. It's not defined as implicit. That seems to be one of its characteristics. <coughs> how about the functional neuroanatomy? The system is rooted in frontal basal ganglia circuits. In fact, we define it in this learning and memory, as I said before, that depends on the basal ganglia. With the basal ganglia, and it's a subcortical structures, including the cotton, the basal putamen, the pelvis, and so on, um, certain portions of the basal ganglia, particularly the ante anterior portions of cotton, the basal putamen, are particularly important at, or at least early phases of learning and consolidation, whereas when that information is largely learned, then that depends more on neocortical regions, including motor premotor cortex, as we have in the next line, processing of automatized routines, but also uh, parietal regions as well. And in fact, the way we think we propose this in a couple of papers, um, of so basically what the basal ganglia does, it's like what the physical campus does, is it, it basically helps the formation of cortical cortical connections. If you have any memory, right? So basically it's saying, this and this are connected either through the hippocampus or through the basal ganglia. Um, and once they both fire, then heavy and learning fire together, wire together. Okay. Um, and so the way actually, you know, this may, the how and that may sound very familiar. This is essentially probably where a lot of the dorsal stream circuitry comes from, from this. Okay. <coughs> so that may be, you know, useful. Uh, we know, again, less about the biological level biological substrates of this system and about uh, declarative memory, but the neurotransmitter dopamine plays an important role and possible genes include a bunch of genes related to dopamine, um, as well as the infamous you know, FOXP2 language gene, which probably is better characterized as at least in part playing an important role in procedural memory and therefore in language, according to the that we'll talk about today. Okay, the two memory systems interact in at least two ways. One is what some people think of like Dan Willingham in terms of cooperative interaction, we think of it in terms of redundant mechanisms. So <clears throat> some functions and tasks, some things we learn, are only learnable by one or the other. Most notably, most clearly, stuff that's arbitrary, so arbitrary bits of information, okay, um, and their connections, their associations, okay, seem to be necessarily learned, have to be learned here. Okay? If you, if you, you have to learn that stuff here like, you know, what I do for capital or dinner and baking and so on. Procedural maybe might be necessary for some things like possibly some motor skills, particularly those that become automatized, much less clear. <coughs> Other task and function, I think it will be the vast majority of stuff that we do in cognition, high level cognition, can be supported by both systems, that is by either system, if you will, but generally in very different ways, different computational mechanisms. So for example, take root learning, okay? Remember what I said before, root learning depended on what? Which system? Declarative or procedural? Remember? Procedural, this was this response to anything where you always turn in the same direction based on training. How else do we navigate? Famous rats, landmark based learning, okay? It's called place learning in the global literature. And basically, so imagine the picture of J on the wall, right? And the rats go, oh, cool, and you turn towards J, right? That's based on the hippocampus, and you can test this, for example, by rotating the T, and now they're gonna turn the other direction towards J, whereas if they've learned procedurally to always turn in one direction, they still turn in the left towards the left. And you can test, you can, you can uh, um, test them this way. Um, there's a reasonably large literature in humans on this alternative um, support by either one or the other system for learning sequences, categorizing words. Okay, <coughs> a lot of work has to do with the weather prediction task um, that some of you may be familiar with. Finally, what are the factors that can push learning in one or the other way, which is real interest to us? Okay, so for example, which system do you think learns first, generally? This or this? Which one's quicker at learning? Declarative, right? So what you often find is you find initial dependence on declarative memory in actually doing the task. Careful about this. You take this very carefully. But then an eventual dependence after enough practice, particularly of the right kind, on procedural memory. 
Now, what actually seems to be going on, and again, this may be useful for you, is learning occurs in both circuits the entire time. But what appears to be the case is that the circuit that has stronger information that's more reliable in terms of access or rapidity of access is the one that predominates. So early on, you've learned very little here. It's just really slow. You have a nice strong representation here. You depend on this. This, in some ways, this is probably very related to blocking and linguistics, um, inhibits or predominates over this one. But eventually, this keeps learning continues the whole time. Good evidence for this. And eventually, this becomes strong enough or fast enough that this predominates. Now, there's work, for example, that if you lesion this, as work from Rhodes, from Packard, you go back to declarative memory, back to place learning, for example. Okay? So that seems to be how, that, how this works. So that this may or may not be useful to some of you. <coughs> a lot of our work um, uh, is based on this notion of which system is better. So if you are particularly good at declarative memory, you're going to tend to rely on declarative memory for a lot of the things that can be used that can depend on your system, such as those we'll see grammar, navigation, sequence learning, category learning, and so on, and vice versa, you're particularly good at procedural memory. Okay. <coughs> And there are other factors too, like explicit versus implicit input and so on, we can talk about a little bit. Um, this one is an interesting one, related less to the work we'll talk about today, um, but it is kind of void nonetheless. So uh, if you lesion one system, then you actually seem to get better at the other system. Probably in both directions, a little is unclear. Um, also estrogen not only seems to enhance declarative memory, but there's some evidence that inhibits uh, basal ganglia function and procedure. I think I finally understand, I'm beginning to understand what's going on in the last year or so. I think what's going on is actually simply that you're not, that if you, for example, have a dysfunction of this, you're not going to learn in it, and therefore you're not going to inhibit this, and therefore it actually seems to get better and vice versa. Or estrogen, if you're really good at this because of estrogen, well, that's basically preventing learning, or at least the eventual dependence on this. So something like that seems to be going on. This is what we call the seesaw effect. Okay. It's a little less relevant to work today, but I think it's, it's important. What it also means is that it's hard to like push one way or the other. Like, okay, let's enhance this. Well, then you, know, you might have a problem with this. So it's tricky. Okay, so about our model, what predictions can we make about language based on this independent knowledge of the true memory systems? So one of the key things we found was that uh, declarative memory seems to be necessary for learning arbitrary bits of information, the relations. Therefore, we should expect that lexical memory should depend heavily on declarative memory. That is the memory store of at least, not only, all word specific information, such as form meaning pairs, um, that are arbitrary, <laughs> meaning pairs, uh, morphologically arbitrary pairs, like big dog, little went, which is partly arbitrary. Um, or in syntax, right, complements. The fact that the bower requires direct object, subtractive English. There's a lot of stuff in language that's arbitrary. And of course, above the word level as well, such as metaphors, they use as well. How <coughs> about procedural memory? Well, procedural memory seems to be key for predictions, involved in sequences and rules. So a reasonable prediction is that it's involved in the grammar. That is the rule governed hierarchical and sequential composition, decomposition of complex forms, again, at different levels. Syntax, combining words, or abstract categories, or integrating features into the hierarchy, um, morphologies such as regulars, or phonology, phonotactics, right? You have these segments, you have your phonemes or your syllables, and you have to combine them according to the phonotactics of the logical grammar of the language. Same thing. Okay. However, we can memorize speeches and lyrics, certainly we can memorize smaller stuff, right? In fact, that's what this eventually becomes. It's that, right? So we would predict that grammar should also depend on declarative memory, not only in thing chunking, as it's called, memorizing eventually this as a word, or walked as a word, or the cat as a chunk, or even something like construction grammar, a lot of Del Goldberg. Um, so noun phrase, uh, verb phrase as some kind of instruction that's stored the way she thinks about it in terms of uh, in memory. Okay? And then it turns out that declarative memory can support aspects of grammar, not only through this chunking, which if you think about it, it's probably relatively limited because you have to chunk things that you've heard before, to the extent that you might not be able to generalize, although of course here you could generalize right? <coughs> to new forms. <coughs> 
um, but also through associative generalization. Um, we've done some work on that, as well as through explicit or possibly implicit rules. So it's not just, I sometimes think this is a little unclear, not just that you can do grammar here or here, but you can do grammar here in several ways. Maybe here as well, it's more clear here, okay? <clears throat> Finally, we can ask, um, what are the factors that modulate the relative dependence of um, grammar on one or the other system? There are a whole bunch of factors. We talked a little bit about this. So sex, for example, male versus female. So if you take an arbitrary baseline of males like this with the two systems, are females higher or lower here on average? Higher, and maybe even because they see some effect like this. So which section depend more on declarative memory for grammar, for sequence learning, for so on? And we have a whole research program on that, which I just um, uh, suggest this week. So I wonder if you ever forgot who works on Parkinson's disease, in part. Yeah. Anyway, so we have a paper a few months ago, came out a few months ago, showing that women, that patients with Parkinson's disease have problems with grammar, but women less than men because they're compensating with declarative. Um, what I'll talk about today is um, in part is second versus first language. So one of the differences between L2 and L1, second versus first language, is that second language is a little later. So we can look at the developmental trajectory <laughs> of that is how they change up during childhood of the two systems. Declarative memory, is it good or bad when you're an infant? Do you remember stuff when you were an infant? No, okay, it's even, it's even a term for infantile amnesia. So it's bad, it gets better during childhood for whatever reasons. Um, seems to plateau, it's peak, but what age do you think? Adolescence, early adulthood. And then unfortunately for most of us, what happens? <laughs> it goes down <laughs> with a, with a non-linear like particular decline in the other age. Okay. Um, how about procedural memory? I usually understand less about this, but it seems to be pretty well established in terms of its learning abilities early on. It seems to decrease either during or after childhood, but maybe during adolescence, perhaps. And then it actually is relatively stable, it declines about the much. Okay, although again, we understand less about this than, than uh, declarative memory. So therefore, a young kid will look like uh, this. So what are they gonna to tend to rely on in terms of this functionality, this difference for grammar? Procedural. Of course, they'll probably still learn for de in declarative first, but they should efficiently and relatively quickly um, procedural should take over. I'm not gonna say transfer, because that's not what happens, okay? And how about like a young adult learning grammar? This is good, this might be worse, so they're gonna rely more on declarative memory. Now they can still proceduralize, right? A 20 year old can still learn to you to ride a bicycle or a unicycle or something, right? But it's gonna be slightly less efficient and they'll be probably, because of the predominance here, and maybe the slight attenuation here, they're gonna transfer a little bit less, but they should nonetheless proceduralize to some extent. Okay. <coughs> um, so and then how about procedural systems function? Like, yes. So what about those two learners? What happens in that case? So we expect that L2 learners will depend heavily on declarative memory, but eventually proceduralize to a fair to something. Exactly the opposite for me. You're not you. You're an exception. It's I, I I cannot tell you what the rule is, but I know how to use it in a different language. <laughs> I'll, I'll show you evidence. Yeah, so super let's look at some evidence afterwards. Yeah, and of course there are lots of individual differences. <coughs> you know, it's like sex difference, not that every person is going to be show this, this pattern. <coughs> so let's look at procedural system dysfunction. So a lot of our work is in developmental disorders, mainly in developmental language disorder, which is less formally known as specific language impairments, but also on dyslexia and other uh, disorders such as Tourette's or autism. And basically, simplistically, and I'll talk about this more later, we, we propose, and there's increasing evidence, that this is true for these, so at least some of these disorders, more complex than that, at least for developmental language disorder. And then, therefore, what would we expect for grammar? Or should grammar depend on kids with more here? Right? There's evidence, a lot of evidence for this uh, in DLD, some evidence for dyslexia. <coughs> Uh, we've already talked about frequency of complex forms. If you hear the cat a lot, you just might memorize this chunk in declarative memory. We already talked about L2 input, right? The more into L2 input, the more you proceduralize. Uh, these are actually quite interesting. Um, maybe useful for some of you. So um, 
I mentioned earlier that you, that when there's rapid feedback, learning takes tends to take place in procedural memory. So if feedback is slow or fast, you can modulate the relative dependence, the predictive dependence and the parent dependence on one or the other system. Okay? And this actually may be related to this, which is it turns out this this we're just starting to look at in language. This we have a fair bit of work on market talk about today. Um, that immersion is much better for reaching native-like neurocognition, including apparent proceduralization, than explicit instruction at the occur in a classroom. And it's probably for a couple of reasons. Probably the explicit instruction itself um, pushes um, learning here. Because remember, though both systems underlie implicit knowledge, only this underlies explicit knowledge. It's a bit confusing, right? So implicit, every learning system in the brain, including kind of not to be a learning system, but probably the underlying implicit knowledge. But the only one to see that seems to really clearly underlie explicit knowledge, arguably, is declarative memory. Okay? <coughs> but I think it's also possible because immersion involves rapid input where you're predicting the next item, which is uh, which would favor uh, learning procedural memory because of fast feedback. <coughs> okay. So now let's go to evidence. So for our theoretical framework and all our particular hypotheses, we see converging evidence, obviously, because you know, every method and task and so on has its weaknesses as well as strengths. Uh, today I'll talk about some of the lines of evidence um, we look at, and we can have some like genetics and endocrine evidence. Um, I'm gonna focus on correlational evidence, neurological evidence from different disorders, neuroimaging evidence, and evidence from eventual potentials. The next four slides are going to be on first language, one slide each for behavioral, neurological, imaging, electrophysiological evidence, then the same thing for second language after a brief reminder of the hypothesis, and then we'll turn to developmental disorders with a focus on DLD. Okay, so correlational evidence, basically the logic is, you know, if you are best at declarative memory and then you get progressively worse, it would predict that who should be best at word learning? You, then you, then you. And if you are progressively worse at procedural memory, what should the prediction be? Should that affect word learning? No, but should it affect grammar learning? Yes. Okay. So that's just the idea. And so as we were talking about earlier, the key here is we actually like this evidence more in some ways than um, neuroimaging evidence, although we present that as well, because when you have neuroimaging evidence of fMRI and you find, uh, you know, caudate activation, uh, even the expected place, anterior caudate for some aspect of the grammar, you don't know whether it's procedural memory or it's some other function that the caudate supports, because no structure in the brain only supports one function. It could be working memory, attention, and so on, but the caudate also supports it. Whereas here, what you're doing is you're taking tasks that have been independently tied to the, the learning and memory systems, and then you see whether their performance correlates with your predicted outcomes, i.e. lexical or grammatical abilities. Okay? So this is in kids, this is the first section on kids. <coughs> it's a meta-analysis. This is a, are we, a study we um, published last year in PNAS. So um, in this meta-analysis, we found that lexical abilities, vocabulary size, lexical retrieval books, and so on in kids were predicted, correlated with abilities that these kids learning abilities in declarative memory, but not procedural memory. In contrast, grammar abilities across syntax and morphology and different types of tasks correlate with procedural memory, but also to some extent declarative memory. So what this does, and here just see more about this, this is lexical ability with types of declarative, uh, procedural and vice versa for grammatical abilities. So what this does is it clearly ties lexical abilities in kids in first language to declarative memory and grammar primarily to procedural memory, but also to declarative memory. And I would expect that if the kids were a bit older, you'd find less declarative memory abilities because they'd have to learn more in procedural memory and rely more on that. <coughs> Here's some neurological evidence. <coughs> so again, I'm contrasting medial temporal lobe amnesia and uh, developmental language disorder, arguably two disorders involving learning. Um, and we see a nice, what might be called a dissociation of associations. So medial temporal lobe amnesia, of course, has medial temporal lobe abnormalities, as you see here. Right? Um, problems with declarative memory and problems with word learning, but typically spared basal ganglia, temporal lobe amnesia. Um, procedural memory, 
is spare. That's how it's discovered in HM. And grammar and grammar learning are relatively spare. And DLD, developmental language disorder, shows the opposite pack. That is, as we'll see later, the medial temporal lobe is relatively normal in DLD, and we can quantitative anatomical synthesis of literature. I know this. Uh, declarative memory is relatively normal, as is word learning, arguably, is more controversial. In contrast, the basal ganglia are abnormal. In fact, it's specific to the head of the copy, which is amazing. We'll get to that later. Uh, procedural memory and grammar are normal. So you have this beautiful dissociation of associations tying um, word learning to um, declarative memory and grammar to procedural memory. You find a similar dissociation between Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. Which one is Alzheimer's like? Well, like in the medial type of amnesia, Parkinson's like DLD. <coughs> Normaging evidence published this a few months ago. This is an activation likelihood estimation meta analysis, neuroanatomical meta analysis of um, functional imaging studies of either word learning or grammar learning. So, this is not, this is related to what we were, what we were talking about, Dick. It's very hard to look at, at uh, language learning in kids. So, this is common but very perfect proxy of looking at these paradigms in adults. Okay? So it's supposed to be viewed as second language learning. Right? Depends on how you interpret it. Um, <coughs> so word learning paradigms um, and grammar learning paradigms both led to activation if you are frontal and posterior parietal regions, but only word learning in inferior uh, temporal regions. So this is basically a ventral stream which is known to feed into parietal cortex and then the hippocampus. So the medial temporal lobe, warning and ventral stream are very close to the side. Um, and grammar, only grammar in the basal ganglia, and I don't know how well you know your neuroanatomy, but what part of the basal ganglia is that? It's the anterior caudate, anterior cutane. Okay, so exactly those portions of the basal ganglia that we expect to be learned to be uh, to underlie early learning in procedural memory, which is of course what these paradigms are looking at. Then we did something kind of cool. We split the grammar paradigms into those that we call declarative or non-declarative learning. These are the declarative learning paradigms of those that the a priori figures have predicted the conditions in which grammar should depend on declarative memory, such as explicit input, um, high chunk strength, and logic grammars, things like that. And we separated those out, and only these led to hippocampal activation, and only these led to copy activation. It's really nice. Okay, so what this shows is that word learning is tied to this ventral stream to the declarative memory system, grammar learning to the basal ganglia, just particular parts of the basal ganglia involved in procedural memory, but even grammar learning can also depend on declarative memory under particular circumstances. <coughs> Finally, ERPs, so lexical anomalies, like I like to eat tables, okay consistently leads to an N400, see there, um, who has grammatical anomalies like yesterday I walk over there, rarely do. N400s are also listed by nonverbal uh, semantic stimuli like faces and objects and so on. This is very well studied. Uh, it's linked to temporal lobe structures, uh, both neocortical, but also probably even more reliably perilinal cortex and hippocampus. And just out of interest, some of you, parental cortex seems to be emerging as a kind of a semantic hub, which basically kind of makes a decision, not to homogenize it too much, of whether something is novel or not, unexpected or not. This goes back to the whole surprise thing we were talking about now. Um, and um, then what a learning is going to take place in the hand. So actually, I meant to bring it up when we were talking, because both systems actually, in different ways, look at prediction, or, uh, are important for prediction. So we've argued um, quite strongly that declarative memory reflects uh, aspects of both processing and learning of declarative memory. <coughs> the left anterior negativity, in, in contrast, is not found for yesterday, like I like to take tables. It is found for yesterday, I walk over there, grammatical numbers. It's also listed by nonverbal sequences. It's automatic, it's early, it's like the frontal regions, which remember otherwise automatized processing with routines. And we have tentatively not very strongly suggested that reflects processing and procedural memory, with much less confidence than for the input on the declarative. So all these lines of evidence, in summary for the L1, um, link words to declarative memory, grammar to procedural memory, 
but also to some extent in declarative memory, such as in kids or with particular learning conditions, such as explicit input. How about L2? <clears throat> so remember that declarative memory improves during childhood. Procedural memory is already good during childhood. So a kid, whether learning their L1 or their L2 would be like this, so it should depend on which system mostly. Procedural, you know, they initially learn here, okay? Um, whereas a second language learner will depend much more on declarative memory, but eventually could proceduralize, okay? It's just a schematic of the same thing. Lexical memory should always depend on declarative memory. First language, second language, DLD, always, right, by hypothesis. Grammar should depend more on declarative memory in second than first language, and then lower than higher exposure, second language, if you haven't proceduralized it yet, and vice versa for procedural memory. More in L1, grammar should depend more on procedural memory in L1 than L2, and higher than lower exposure in L2. It's the same paper, but now instead of looking at first language, we're looking at second language, and we're not looking, we're not looking at lexical and grammar here. Turns out that luckily for us, people testing our hypothesis about world these memory systems in second language have mainly looked at grammar at lower and higher exposure, which is much more interesting. Okay? And what our meta-analysis showed, and this is really striking, right, is that grammar at low experience is predicted associated with declarative memory, learning abilities, not procedural, and vice versa at high. So early on, when you're learning a second language, you depend on declarative memory for grammar and on procedural memory at high. Um, neurological evidence. Sorry, I'm going quickly here. <laughs> um, when you have lesions to the um, temporal lobe, such as in Alzheimer's disease, you have more problems in grammar in the L2 than L1. But who cares? You can probably damage my kidney or my knee on more problems in the L2 speaker. The converse that really matters. And this is really cool. And now a number of studies um, <clears throat> that suggest that, that indicate that frontal events of ganglia um, lesions, including in Parkinson's disease, lead to more problems with the grammar in L1 than L2, and at the higher than low exposure L2 without clear similar patterns. So that really nicely ties grammar relatively specifically um, to procedural memory in the L1 more than the L2 in the higher well, the low compared to low exposure L2. Uh, this is another meta-analysis. Instead of language learning paradigms in the laboratory, such as artificial grammars and languages or word learning paradigms, this is actual second languages. Uh, this is still in preparation. So lexical abilities. Um, are particularly tied to, again, the ventral stream in L2, okay, and grammar to the anterior part of L2. So again, this is actually a beautiful replication because it's a completely different set of studies, right? So word learning seems to be tied to the ventral stream and grammar learning to the caudate and continue. And remember that, I don't know this is, I know I'm doing this really fast and there's lots of information here. Um, but remember that it's in the learning phase that we expect uh, caudate and putamen um, involvement because afterwards it becomes automatized dependent on, on cortex. So basically, there's a thing that is just one cortical cortical connection. So the fact that we're finding this in L2 but not in L1 exactly makes sense of that. It's getting the same course of the language learning paradigms. <clears throat> Finally, electrophysiological evidence, ERPs. As expected, we find in 400s. If I say I like to eat tables, if you're a first or second language speaker, you'll show in 400s. And it would be your lower high exposure L2 because in 400s should always be found because words and semantic information should always be learned in declarative memory. In contrast, grammar, we find the left anterior negativity for L1, as we saw before. As low exposure L2, you find in 400s or anterior positivity, probably. P3 is tension related components, probably related to explicit learning, and then lands at high exposure. Very much consistent with the way. Bottom line with L2 is as an L1, words are learned where? Everybody point here. And grammar is learned much more in declarative memory than L1, but eventually could be procedurized to some extent. Finally, um, last part of the talk is developmental disorders with a focus on developmental language disorder. Our neurocognitive hypothesis is that various developmental disorders result at least in part in different ways, I'm not saying they're all the same, 
um, abnormalities of brain structures that underlie procedural memory. And moreover, declarative memory remains largely normal in most of these disorders, in most individuals, and compensates for these procedural problems plus a whole host of other problems. Published paper here is back, I'm in Pullman 2015, which talks about this compensation for many kinds of problems, procedural problems across a variety of developmental disorders. <coughs> These disorders may include, in different ways, developmental language disorder, dyslexia, autism, Tourette's, ADHD, OCD, and development coordination disorder. Okay. Um, and we suggest that this hypothesis may explain a wide range of behavioral and neural patterns in these different disorders, as well as their selective comorbidities, because the same circuitry is being affected, although differently in different disorders, with different additional circuitry as well as our suggestion. <coughs> and a lot of this work, as well as if you're in procedural memory more generally, you can look at a new paper of ours, this one with Sayad as well, which is, is coming out, it's already out there uh, uh, in any of your psychology. So it really goes into depth in what procedural memory is, how it works, what it supports, what it supports in language, and then um, the focus of the paper is actually on developmental disorders, including not only DLD, but also dyslexia, stuttering, and some others, including childhood practice resolution. <clears throat> so DLD is basically idiopathic language problems in kids. You have language problems in a kid, but caused by something specific like another disorder, a particular um, gene mutation, you have DLD. Okay? It's associated importantly, but not uniquely with grammatical problems across syntax, morphology, and phonology. <coughs> Previous explanatory accounts have been broadly of two types. It's a grammar deficit, like Hill and Clausen, Werner Goffnick, Heather Vandalelli. They find you can explain the grammar problems, these particular types, but you can't explain the memory problems with those accounts, or motor problems with those accounts. Then you have another camp, which is it's a processing problem. A rapidly kind of stimuli or a working memory or processing capacity. Okay, fine. But you can't explain other things as well, such as other problems like the motor problems or even the grammar problems very well. Plus, both of these classes of accounts are functional, they're behavioral, right? But it's, you know, DLT is not rooted in the liver, it's rooted in the brain. So ideally, you'd want an account which takes into account both the brain and the behavioral characteristics. So with this in mind, <laughs> we proposed a procedural deficit hypothesis, which again is laid out in detail in this new paper. Um, so according to the PDH procedural deficit hypothesis, uh, DLD can be largely explained, so it's a brain anatomically based hypothesis, can be largely explained by abnormalities of brain structures, underlying procedural memory, in particular frontal basal ganglia structures, which underlie the system, especially of Broca's region of the caudate nucleus, which underlie grammar as procedural memory underpinnings. These abnormalities will, of course, lead to problems with procedural memory, including grammar, but also, again, this is a misunderstanding sometimes, in problems with other functions that depend on these structures, including working memory. Remember, I mentioned the caudate nucleus also underlies working memory and attention. Okay? The illusion that why should it be unique to procedural memory problems, right? So it's like, you know, it's like saying, you know, my hand has a slapping problem, you have a big hole in my hand, but I also have a grasping problem. Okay. So it's better described as a hand problem. Okay. <coughs> and these grammatical and other deficits will be at least partly compensated for by the clinic. This is simply an overview of the evidence. So basically, the evidence suggests that declarative memory is spared and procedural memory and its associated functions are impaired. It's entry in particular the caudate, as we see the head of the caudate, procedural memory, grammar, and other associated functions that depend on that circuit. So we proposed this in depth at first in 2005. Since then, there have been more than this, actually, this is now a few years old, I don't know, 10 or 15 um, studies looking at procedural memory in DLD. And this is um, early meta analysis. It's just been confirmed in later meta analyses showing that, in fact, DLD. Um, is associated with procedural memory impairments. Uh, this is a new study that's now under revision. Um, we used to invent the new technique, which actually somebody may be interested in. We'll say this in a couple more sentences. So the problem with activation likelihood estimation is that it requires whole brain um, scanning and analyses. And 
the results for potent stereotactic coordinates, XYZ coordinates. Okay? Many studies use other techniques to report that, region of interest analyses, and so on and so forth. So we invented a new technique with Peter Turkle's help, who also invented the AL original years ago. And basically, the logic of this approach is very simple. For each study, where did they look? What did they examine? This structure, that structure, this structure. Did they find, in this case, abnormalities? You also do this for activation. And so you look at the proportion weighted by subject numbers and do a permutation analysis looking at likelihood that this finding is not a chance. Very similar to the permutation analysis in, in AL. Okay, and based on parcellations. And so basically, we found with structural abnormalities, only highly reliable in frontal cortex, collateral and medial, and the basal ganglia. Specifically, when you go, when you do subparcellations to see where this is in the cardiac index. Structural abnormalities only at a localized level in the cardiac nucleus. Where's that? That's the cardiac. Look at that. Totally different from the story that we've all heard a thousand times, which is where? Superior temporal cortex. Beware of people repeating the same thing. And one of the problems, of course, is everyone looks at the same thing and finds it because they look for it. Right? But if you take into account the number of studies, then you actually find something different. Okay? Proportion of studies. And then for functional imaging, it's a little less um, reliable because there are fewer studies, but again, frontal basal ganglia. Then it's a bit different at the lower level. Broca's region is particularly affected, and actually pertain, which may be playing a compensatory role if the client is damaged. So the bottom line of this is DLD is associated most clearly with abnormalities of frontal and basal ganglia structures, not the superior temporal cortex. It's not reliably. It's not nothing. It's not nearly as reliable. Okay, medial temporal lobe is largely spared, and the head of the cardiac is particularly good. Last few slides. Declarative memory is relatively normal, especially even for verbal information once you, you basically control for things like verbal work problems and working memory problems. I'm going faster now. And can the DLD compensate um, by memorizing forms like chunking, the cat, learning explicit rules, or just correlation analyses? We see that whereas typically developing kids. Um, this went into the meta-analysis before. Vocabulary is predicted by declarative memory, grammar by procedural. Both depend on associated with declarative memory, suggesting compensation, compensation, compensation from the kids. And then finally, a similar thing with ERPs. Typical kids show in for 100 in a LAN or lexical synthetic anomalies. DLD show in for 100 for both, suggesting the depends on Okay. So bottom line, it's the same. Slide I should go over it with a bit more detail. Converging evidence from behavioral, neurological, imaging, and electrophysiological evidence suggests the language depends on both learning and memory systems. Lexical and grammatical knowledge depend differentially in the two systems. The learning and processing of lexical knowledge depends heavily on declarative memory. Also, a little bit, but much, much less surprisingly. We'll talk about that in the end. And we kind of get surprised this is so low. Here's so far, so far at least. Whereas rule governed grammatical knowledge depends heavily on procedural, but also on declarative memory as a function of these particular factors, such as born females and males, L2.1, is good declarative memory for in cases of bad procedural, like irritable or dyslexia. Okay? So the bottom line here is you can do grammar different ways. You know, we have a tendency in our field is no, it's done this way. I was talking to someone about this earlier. Okay? Well, no, it's not like. Construction grammar versus minimalism is done both ways, right? This is how biology works, right? Thermal regulation, you have fat, you have hair, you have chevrolet, you have antifreeze molecules, you have drinking a hot soup, cold shower, et cetera, et cetera. You wouldn't expect the same for cognition, including language, given its importance, plus its plasticity. And here we see you can do grammar in these ways and multiple ways within this as well. Okay? So I think it's really important to keep that in mind. <coughs> Lots of implications. So for example, this is a fun one that if, I'll make this quick, a number of these disorders, developmental disorders, um, are more prevalent in males than females. No one knows why, and usually different explanations are given for all these different disorders, despite the fact that all developmental may have, often have com com comorbidities with each other in certain patterns. So this is DLD as an example. 
This is males, this is females. Who's going to compensate better? On average, of course, it's females. So we simply suggest that part of the reason for higher male prevalence is that females tend to compensate their way out of diagnosis. So how are people diagnosed? Just be noticing. Okay. Uh, this is kind of fun. So given, I mentioned this before briefly, given that we know how to improve learning and memory in these systems, this has implications for therapies or for, you know, for disorder or for um, second language learning. So we're starting to look at that. And a new study that's about to be submitted, which we tested Turkish university students learning English um, and used the spacing and testing effect, which work most clearly in declarative memory. And we found a massive increase in their ability to learn and retain the words with spacing and testing as compared to not, which is really cool. And this can probably be used for disorders as well. Uh, finally, we're getting into reading, math, and there is aging. So can dyslexia be explained by the PDH? And so in the annual review paper, we go into this in some depth. Uh, we think yes, at least to some extent. It's different than DOP, but we can. Um, <coughs> in fact, better analyses of like the serial reaction type tests clearly show procedural deficits, learning deficits, and dyslexia. Uh, this is a new study that I think is now under revision, or it hasn't been submitted yet, I'm not sure. Uh, Sayoko which basically, it's um, Lori Cuttings depends on this uh, study as well. Um, Lori's big uh, LURD project where she has tested about 100 kids at first, second, third, fourth grade longitudinally. And we found, and she ran both SRT tests, uh, test and a declarative memory test developed in my lab. And we found that um, both predicted reading ability and declarative memory at earlier uh, grades and procedural memory later grades. You guys won't expect it as procedural memory. Stuff was born in procedural memory. Uh, math, uh, we proposed with Tanya Evans that math disability might be part explained by the PDH procedural problems. And now we have a study of math learning the same in um, Lori Cutting's data set, which typically implicates declarative memory. And then another collaboration in Belgium looking at the same thing with no results yet. And finally, a new area that I think some of you are interested in is aging. Um, our hypothesis, and so one of the major problems we all have as we get older is word finding and word learning. Okay? And previously people have suggested mainly executive functions uh, decreases or processing speed are responsible for that. And based on this framework, we propose that hippocampal declines, and declarative memory declines based on the hippocampus are responsible. Um, and then we have very specific predictions such as recollection versus familiarity, recently, recent words in the language versus older words, or versus high frequency words to be undergo less systems consolidation and dependent upon the uh, neocortex. And we've tested so far about 40 people, and it looks quite promising. So we have actually, what I just described to you is like exactly what we found. So only in recall, not in comprehension, only in Low frequency, not high frequency words, only recent words in the language, not older words in the language. Really quite striking. And we're also doing image analysis. So, and if you want to learn more about this and even generally about aging and language, you might want to uh, talk to or invite my postdoc, Anna Ryder Gester, who that's her area is the language. So, and that's the same study that we found the April results in. She found. That's it. That's how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for going so fast. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you know uh, when the basal ganglia develop in human development? Um, they develop relatively early because, and the reason I ask is because you know we have all this evidence from infants, and infants are very good at learning statistical learning. Um, sequence learning yeah. and so forth. And there are also developmental changes that are occurring very rapidly during infancy. So, one, of course, they're good at procedural yeah. learning. Um, how does that relate to the development of the structure? I don't know. I don't know. So, I know. So, um, and I, it's like one of the things on my list. So, um, in general, we know more. I was talking to, I guess, most people about this. We know much more about these kinds of things in the declarative memory screen. Development uh, of the hippocampus, which does definitely could improve. There are people who, in the infant literature, who even claim, you know, there is no declarative memory in infants, which I find 
exponential. Yeah. So that's basically what I was saying before. Um, one of the problems that I was talking to Gnome about is that, so I, I don't know what the, for example, volumetric measures are. And it's tricky because you have to look at which, what you look at. You look at anterior caudate, anterior putamen, two combined, the whole caudate, you know. So I just don't know that. I'm um, sure it's out there. You know, there's big studies at the NIH. That should be part of the results, right? But in general, you would think those- I would think that I don't even really know whether there are co complex. clear correlations between <coughs> any of those volumes, along which one, and these abilities that we're talking about, which probably haven't been tested much because people don't test those abilities very much, which is different than your question, which is just what is the volume look like? And I don't know. So I'm sure it's not. I should. Yeah. So uh, this is great stuff, but uh, I guess maybe I have a really basic uh, confusion where you have these systems compensating for each other, but you are, I think, depending on their being extremely different in terms of their functionality and I guess their representational capabilities. So do you end up with two language systems and one can kind of take over for the other? Are they the same system that are just being addressed in different yeah. ways? Uh, I think there's no simple answer to that. I think that language depends on learning in both different extents based on all these factors. Remember that both are underlying the learning of cortical, the creation of cortical cortical connections anyway. There's some different connections, right? So that basically anyway seems to primarily but not only underlie the posterior to frontal and parietal frontal connections, but not only. Um, so a lot of this is like how to get there, but I think it's a lot more than that. Um, but yeah, it's like this complex thing. Exactly. It's exactly right. And it varies in all these different ways, which to me is really appealing. I think like, well, that should be happening for us. That's all right. No, but I mean, is it that uh, your declarative system can repeat something of itself over and over again so that it gets proceduralized, or is it just that? You mean internally? Uh, yeah, or is it that you know the other system catches up and, and notices the pattern? So I, mean, I think I don't know. So for example, if you have, you know, I mentioned this a bit before in terms of uh, the seesaw effect, right? If yeah. you have more and more learning here. Then, in a way, and I've struggled with this, right? In a way, you need, you don't need this. If you are using declarative memory to produce what are internally, right? Which is often a part of consolidation, part of consolidation, right? Um, then you're getting better at this, but you're also getting the opportunity for this to learn. But then the more you storm you're on here, the more it will predominate over this. That's, but that's what the appropriate it suggests. Now, does that like, provide an easy answer? No, but that, that is what seems to be going on. <laughs> so just to kind of follow up on Doug's point, I think, um, I think this is just to, let me try to say, see whether you agree, that the, the, these two systems do two things at once. One is they are scaffolding cortical, cortical, not learning knowledge, which is outside of those systems fundamentally is what in some important sense, right? And at the same time, they are actually encoding knowledge that is either there sort of while the critical critical stuff stuff's getting wired up, or it's just there in the long run that gets used. And it's sort of yes. both of those at once, right? And so it is they're they're scaffolding and they are the storage of knowledge that's themselves. That's exactly right. I'm actually going to this thing and we'll give a little bit. So for example they have said and say something to the effect that in the longer term, consolidation or consolidation can be defined, not defined as increased reliance on the cortical core connections formed by the beta connections. The connections are still there and can't even rely on the vital. It's the same with hippocampus, right? Your hippocampus is doing these, creating these you know, very rapid links to different cortical representations. Eventually, those are formed, but you still have this, and particularly this. Reduced dependence on the hippocampus, which is defined by systems consolidation, right? And that's increased on, on the cortical core connections. The hippocampus can usually be relied on for, for example, lower frequency form. That's why in, in aging, we predicted that lower frequency forms would still go down because they're still relying on the hippocampus. And so, you know, people like Morris Moskovich and others talk about hippocampus being relied on, particularly for all the biographical stuff. Why? Well, probably because, like, because that's not something that's repeated about that. You know, you're just internally maybe remembering this occasion. But you don't hear Paris is the capital of France 
by her own personal experience and so many times that that system consolidation reduced dependency. So that's exactly right. It's both are doing this, but both are continuing those representations that they are initially creating are continuing to be relied on at least to some extent. And can I follow up? So, do you feel like you or, or other people have made, you know, have been able to kind of uh, get leverage on the properties of the court of the court system itself and how learning there uh, um, can sort of interact with these systems and, and, and change what it looks like in its own right? So, right, presumably, the, so I guess the question, right? So, we try to try and draw the, the the algorithm for how learning happens, you know, outside these systems in the court. It's got a particular, it's gonna have some properties to it, right? Do we know what those properties are like uh, that, that differentiate that system from the other two? And then once you put, so now, now I'm talking about a, a triangle, but I suppose, right? Uh, and so, so what's that third part of the triangle doing? So I think what you asked is something I've thought less about, but I have a, I think I have somewhat of an answer for it, which is to what extent do, can cortical cortical connections be formed or strengthened? Right? Just I think different questions, independent of these more plastic non neocortical structures, and including others I haven't mentioned, particularly cerebellum, which I just said, yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> right, because that also seems a bit of a simple problem. Um, I think, I don't know. I think that's. My impression is from different books that I'm including in the temple of my knees, it says that cortical cortical connections are just hard to form from scratch. I think they can be strengthened, at least temporarily, as part of priming. That lot of priming basically is existing. That's why priming itself is new cortical, right? Um, um, and then, you know, what you didn't ask, but I didn't mind while we were talking because I think about this recent and the interaction between, so we talked a little bit about this cortical cortical connections and processing and further work. So this avoids the like 10 to 100 idea that when you have something unexpected that's surprising, for example, that the in this case, for declarative memory, perirenal cortex goes, oh, I didn't expect that. I better learn that kind of passes in some sense, which we better understand the information to the campus, which then learns it, which then strengthens it, and therefore the next time processing in the ventral stream is stronger, right? plus unexpected. Not quite a question, but it, that they do interact. With them. Yeah. In your implication, why do you fell into a portion? So I'm just wondering if you could speak more about that, about the L2, maybe interventions, and whether by things are compensating, because the facial ganglia and frontal are involved in bilingualism. So I'm just wondering whether. So. I think this relates to several things we were just talking about. Um, I think that interventions to improve world learning are a lot easier to think about and make predictions about because world learning only depends on, appears to depend on one system. So like that spacing testing thing, you just basically improve learning here, whether it's through pharmacological means like an anti you know, colonist race inhibitors or whatever, spacing, testing effect, depth of you know, processing, stuff like that. Great, that's easy, right? Grammar is going to be hard, right? Because you improve this, you might kind of delay or inhibit dependence on procedure memory, which might be your ultimate goal. So I guess I don't have a clear answer. I mean, one thing, you know, when people, because I, you know, I talked to the second night, gave a talk at the State Department a couple of weeks ago, you know, language learning institute there. Depends on what your goal is. If your goal is rapid learning, then probably push this, even for grammar. If your goal is automatization, then maybe you want to very much like the uh, really question, push this, but also then push this as well so that you can then, you know, this may be required to have more practice in result in this, but you don't want to push this so much that you're going to not automatize as reliably. Does that answer your question, kind of? I don't I think, I mean, I, I see the connection basically and frontal and people, but I, to me, I think in bilingualism and how they're both involved, it's still not fully clear. How both systems are involved? Um, yeah. Well, the one liner that I presented today, which I think summarized the evidence is, in L2, 
as an L1, words are always learned here. And grammar is learned here more in L2 than L1, but you can eventually proceduralize it. But that proceduralization and reduced dependence on declarative memory seems to happen less in L2 than L1, probably because a combination of this being better in L2 than L1 kids, this being worse, and other factors that I only have briefly alluded to, such as a lot of L2 learning happens in explicit contexts, which will encourage this. Yeah, that, that help? Just to, so the proceduralization or auto, maybe if we say automization, just to be careful. Doesn't necessarily, and, and I don't think he actually said it this way, but doesn't, if, you, if you're kind of not needing to declare it as much, it doesn't mean you're doing procedural. It might. It could mean that it's just been automatized elsewhere. Uh, I love. I love these questions. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know. <laughs> the rest of the hard question. I wondered about this. So I think it depends. I think this is another question. Which connection? So the way we think, a lot of automatization has to do with a an active process. This, this dorsal street stuff, right? This, this parietal to frontal, particular to motor. Um, and I guess I don't even know to what extent those particular cortical vertical connection can be. So yes, you're absolutely right, I think, that any cortical cortical connection, wherever it is, not just the dorsal street type, right, or frontal, the more you learn it, the more strong it will be and the more automatic. I agree. Absolutely, but I'm not sure if the same connections can be made by either system. I kind of think that good. That's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I agree. Yeah. Last one, we take yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, no, I'm just thinking like five different questions to ask, but this is the one I'm going to end up with. It's the one I won't be able to answer. The problem. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about aging later, too. Yeah. Um, that's, not, that's, not that, that's not the one. Um, so you talk about the two systems that can compensate and all that. I guess I'm curious, how easy is that shit? Like, if you, you know, automatize something pretty quickly in either one, whichever, you know, and then some, some kind of, you know, damage happens or whatever, how easily can you bring that other system back online? That's a good question. Uh, I, I, the, I only, the only evidence I can think of right now is when I mentioned briefly before this work on, on rodents where uh, Packard lesion, so they learn grass bark. Uh, Place learning first, and eventually they had to learn this anglia. Um, I can't remember what the training regimen is, but I do remember that. And then the issue of the basic anglia went back to place learning. Now, you know, how easily, when, I don't know. But it does, it does go back, which is cool, right? So yeah, it's still I'm, there. I'm just really interested in, in how, I mean, how that shift can happen. So a lot of times when I read your work or hear you speak, um, the model that's in the back of my mind was from when I was a programmer on Alan Mills' store project back in the beginning of the year. Right? I, I used that. to watch the chunks <laughs> go in your class. Right? You know, I used to watch the chunks go by, right? And you open up the problem set, and that's your procedural learning, right? But then it gets chunked out, and it gets just thrown into the massive memory. And there's no actual difference between whether it was a hardcore, you know, hard-coded, you know, declarative memory or procedural memory. But the interesting phenomena in those models is that you would get to a point where we had what you called masking, which is you figured out how to do it in a certain way, and even though that way is wrong, and you have the knowledge to do it the right way, you can't get back to that initial learning step because you've already figured out a way to do it, and, and that is like I too fast. I think that's, that feels right with respect to, for example, proceduralizing. Remember one of the things I think I mentioned briefly is that automatized procedures through one person in the case of Anglia are difficult to change. Right. Okay, I mean, think of it more in everyday life. Yeah. So the word habits, that's, that's a word that's right. often used in the procedural right. Right. That's often how it's often used, actually. But I guess I'm, so then, so that's habits the, are hard to change. So then how do you get back to, to you know, rely, you know, when you're doing this, like, seesaw thing, how, how can you really get back to relying on what, you know, your other area? Well, but in, in language, we don't we, wouldn't we not very frequently learn the wrong thing? We don't, by definition, at least in first language, the grammar we be learned is the grammar that's around us. Yes, right. My second language, I don't know. So I'm not sure we need to 
break those well, there's a lot, I don't know. We, we can talk about this one. So one interesting example of this, just at a very fine rate level, let's say your native language is a language that, uh, sorry, David left. Let's say your native language is like a, like a Polish, right, that doesn't have articles in it. And believe me, it's really hard for a Polish native speaker to now learn how to produce <coughs> English articles correctly. And this happened to be my master's project. So the hypothesis is that the language processing mechanism for that language just skips over the choice point of where you have to express definiteness. And that becomes automatic. So how do you then restructure the system so that, that it can learn that that's a relevant feature? That's a beautiful you know, it's, yeah, that's great. And it, I mean, it, it's everywhere, lots of different cases like that. That's a kind of a masking where you learn an automatic procedure and you know, without some kind of, I guess, explicit instruction, but even with explicit instruction, those they're people, still hard to break. Them. They can't do that. I mean, it's really hard. Perfect. So anyway, we, we, we need I, to I love your guys' questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Great questions. Questions. Thank you so much. Um, Michael, what time is your training?